one and all, and listen to tales of excitement and adventure. Tales of daring heroes, savage monsters, and bards who just couldn't keep it in their pants. Tales of friendship, nobility, drunken foolishness, and unforgettable fun. These are tales of role-playing games, fair listeners, and this is Rollin' Bones. My name is Ryan Howard, and I shall be your god. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Danishes and Dragons, your RPG morning show. My name is Ryan Howard. I am your host and king of the boneheads, and you may notice that I've got my trash hair today because I am going to get my hair cut. So, apologies in advance for that. <clears throat> I also feel like a drug addict when I get on here and my hair looks like this, but, you know... When you're going to get your hair cut, it's best not to put a bunch of product in your hair. I found it's a lot easier on the stylists. Maybe it gives them a better idea of kind of what you're going for. But I don't know. They, they end up just spraying your hair down and knocking everything over and stuff like that. So I, it, it lets them skip a step. So... Today, we are going to be building a Dexterity Paladin in 5th edition. Uh, this is somewhat of an unusual choice. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about kind of where we get the concept of the Paladin from and, and why this doesn't usually uh, enter our minds as an option when it comes to Paladins. But it's actually... Uh, building a Finesse Paladin with lighter armor is actually not a suboptimal choice. It ends up working out pretty good, especially with certain feats that you take. But for the most part, uh, typically we think of paladins as being super strong and, you know, wearing full plate armor. And there's obviously nothing wrong with that. That's, you know, it's, it's always cool to be that kind of, uh, you know, tank for Jesus, as it were, uh, as a lot of paladins end up being. Uh, you also don't necessarily have to, you know, be a super religious paladin, especially not in 5th uh, edition where your oaths are not necessarily oaths to a certain god. <clears throat> they're, they're oaths to an ideal. And sometimes even oaths to a, like, a mortal person. There's an oath of the crown that you can get in the Sword Coast Adventures Guide uh, that basically makes you a, a super-powered knight, as it were. So yeah, that's, that's something that's obviously changed. Um, it's... You're, you're not a cleric with more sword powers and less spells. Uh, it, I guess in some ways you are, but there, there's a lot more to being a paladin than just that. Um, and that's a very kind of old conception of a paladin. We'll get into some of the history around that and then talk a little bit about where the inspiration for this kind of paladin comes from. <clears throat> but first, breakfast. Obviously, you can't have an adventure without breakfast, and uh, today I ended up making pancakes. Um, I was trying to save pancakes for the longest time, uh, you know, for, for when Mike Cousins comes back on and we talk about, you know, comic-style painting in, in greater detail, which I've been doing a lot of recently, if you uh, have been following my Instagram, which is at Howard underscore Ryan Gregg, for anyone who hasn't. Um... And we're still going to do pancakes, because he's got a cool pancake recipe that he wants to share. <clears throat> but yesterday, I just really wanted pancakes, so I decided I'm going to make myself some pancakes. And um, Healthy and I, you know, we went to the store, we made the batter from scratch. It's not difficult. Um, it's like a handful of ingredients. In fact, it's so easy to make Pancake batter from scratch, I wonder why people even buy pancake mix. I didn't realize how easy this was until I did it. But it's it's literally just flour, sugar, baking powder, salt, and then two tablespoons of butter, 
milk, and an egg. You whisk the dry ingredients together, you whisk the wet ingredients together, you put the wet in the dry ingredients, mix that all up, make sure it's not uh, too smooth or too lumpy. You want a good kind of medium, <clears throat> happy medium there, and then uh, you stick them on a skillet. I used a cast iron skillet because I would use a cast iron skillet for anything. I love having that cast iron skillet. The cast iron skillet may be the single most valuable thing that uh, was brought into our kitchen. And it was actually given to us as a gift because Lodge screwed up one of Elfie's co-workers' orders. So we accidentally ended up getting a cast iron skillet. And I have not looked back since. Um, I love that thing. <clears throat> If you told me I could have either an oven or a cast iron skillet that I had to, like, use over a fire, I think I might take the cast iron skillet. So, that's how we made pancakes. Um, yeah, I made some plain ones for Elfie, and then I put chocolate chips in mine because I'm a child. Um... I, I get very serious about my chocolate chip pancakes. I, I love chocolate chip pancakes. And uh, I remember on our honeymoon, uh, I'd never been to Denny's before. And before anyone jumps down my throat, in kind of the Charlotte area that I grew up in, uh, there weren't really any Denny's around. Denny's was not like a thing where I grew up. Uh, we had one IHOP. Actually, there were a couple IHOPs in and around the area, but there was one, like, the one major IHOP in Huntersville. And there were Waffle Houses everywhere, because it's Waffle House. And I thought, you know, Waffle House was everywhere until I moved to Tennessee and realized that there's a Waffle House at every exit. Pretty much. And if there's not, then just wait three months and there'll be one. And Waffle Houses around here don't close, they move. So if your Waffle House shuts down, it's just going to go like two miles down the road somewhere else. And you'll, you'll have a new Waffle House here in just a little bit. And a new Waffle House is always a very confusing thing because you walk in there and you're like, it's clean. I, I thought they would have, you know, like pre-aged the place. I didn't think you could actually pull off making Waffle House food in a clean kitchen environment, like a, a brand new kitchen. I thought they had to do like some kind of patina-ing to everything, but no, no. It turns out, turns out you can make Waffle House food in any quality kitchen because they're mostly just kind of making regular breakfast food with regular ingredients. Yeah, Elfie, that, that bother, it, well, it doesn't bother me. I, I'm glad that they don't pre-grease the Waffle House, but yeah, it's uh, it was interesting. I've only been in like one brand new Waffle House in my lifetime. Uh, back before Elfie and I moved, uh, they opened a Waffle House at our old exit, and we got to kind of sort of christen a new Waffle House, which was a uh, an interesting experience. Did we christen two Waffle Houses, or did they open two Waffle Houses at that exit? Because I only remember going to one brand new Waffle House. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the one, there's a Waffle House over in Cool Springs that's pretty new. Um, what I'm talking about is like eating there within the first week of operation, though. Because uh, that Waffle House has been around uh, longer than we've been eating there. It's it's pretty new, but still, it's. I, I'm talking about like the the doors to this place just opened a few days ago. That that level of new for a Waffle House. Because even like within the first month, there's plenty of opportunity for for a Waffle House to grease up. Um, grease gets everywhere. If you ever cook with greasy foods, uh, you know why. Fast food restaurants have a grease trap. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty easy for stuff to build up there. Anyway, 
We were talking about Denny's, and I just go off on new Waffle Houses. Um, so yeah, there were no really Denny's around where I lived, and my parents didn't really care about, you know, like, going to Denny's, because my parents never, like, smoked weed or anything like that, I guess, so... My parents were never the kind of people who were out into the wee hours of the morning, so, uh... They never really, uh, frequented these all-night breakfast places, and they did not have the same passion for breakfast that I had. I don't know if that's a fair statement to make, um... Now that I think about it, because I get my passion for breakfast from my parents, but it's it's something that kind of developed over time. We did not have breakfast every Saturday morning, or we did not have like a, a big family breakfast every Saturday morning, because um, I always remember, when, you know, when we did have one, it was an event, uh, you know, like mom would make pancakes and there'd be bacon and mom would be like, hey, we're having breakfast this morning. Instead of, you know, wake up, find your Pop-Tarts, find your cereal, make whatever you want. Mom would be like, I'm making breakfast for everyone. Which was great, because Mom is a fantastic cook. And she'd make biscuits. Uh, she did not make biscuits from scratch, though. Uh, we always use the Pillsbury. I don't know why my mom didn't make biscuits from scratch. Um, <sighs> she revealed that she could when I told her that I had made them from scratch once. She's like, oh yeah, I can do that. You gotta use cold butter. I was like, why didn't you do that growing up? We could have been having fresh biscuits this whole time. I didn't get that mad at her. Because you, you can't be like, why did you do more work for me, mom? It's it's not really... Not when you have a mother like I did, who, you know, like, provided for us and cared for us. Also, Seven Mundo, welcome. But no, my parents do love breakfast. They just didn't make a big deal out of breakfast the way I do, uh, because nobody is quite as good at making a big deal out of small things uh, as I am. Uh, you can ask my wife about that. So, never been to Denny's, but we were in Orlando at Universal Studios for our honeymoon, and Elfie goes, let's go to Denny's. I was like, I've never been to Denny's. Okay, let's let's go, because I was looking for breakfast places. Elfie's not a big breakfast person, but she does love Denny's. And uh, we go there. And I'm like, okay, I want these. Uh, ooh, they've got these Ghirardelli chocolate chip pancakes. That sounds delicious. I'm, I'm, I'm here for that. So we order, and they are out of chocolate chips. And I don't know if my day was actually ruined, uh, but breakfast definitely was. And uh, I, I believe Elfie can, can attest to uh, my, my downcastness from the time that what I ordered instead of the chocolate chip pancakes showed up, uh, came to the table. <laughs> was I in a bad mood the rest of the day? Because I feel like roller coasters make me happy, but <sighs> okay, I guess I was in a bad mood the rest of the day because I didn't get my chocolate chip pancakes. You guys know what kind of, what caliber of person you're dealing with here on this show. In a day where I'm on my honeymoon with a woman that I love and, you know, we're, we're at one of my favorite places on earth, Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida. I can have my whole day ruined by not getting my chocolate chip pancakes. Um, so, yeah. You want to talk about you want to talk about bonds and flaws and, uh, you know, things like that that you put on a character sheet. That seems like a massive one. I don't remember it ruining my whole day, but I, it, it must have. It, I guess it did. Because Elfie wouldn't make that up, and uh, I can be a pain in the ass to be around if certain things don't go the way I want them to. Uh, so, there's that. 
Anyway, that is my love and devotion for chocolate chip pancakes in a nutshell. Uh, Elfie, how are your pancakes? Did they get overdone uh, when I left them in the oven to uh, to like retain their heat? Are they are they good? Done in the middle? Uh, give us a pancake report, if you will. And uh, while we are awaiting the pancake report, okay, cool. So Alfie ended up putting raspberries on her, uh, and everything was like done in the middle, all that. Mine were done in the middle. Just want to make sure yours were, because I did yours first. I was a little bit worried about how done they got on the outside. But anyway, uh, today we are talking about dexterity paladins. Uh, so paladins are super interesting. Uh, they're, they're one of the most powerful classes in 5th edition. I've witnessed this firsthand. Um, at a certain level, uh, and that level is about 15, at 15th level, the 5e Paladin is basically unstoppable. Because uh, <laughs> you've got a super high AC... Um, immunity to being poisoned, this aura of protection that ups their saves and everyone else's saves. Um, undead and demons basically can do nothing to them. Uh, and they can do all kinds of nasty things to undead and demons. And devils, so fiends. Undead and fiends, to use the, the 5e uh, terminology. They can, even more than like a cleric's turn undead, paladins are just like vaporize undead. And the, they're just, they're, they're unstoppable. It's like having Juggernaut, but he, you know, prays. So... It's always good to, you know, like, play a paladin, and if you really want the power gamer experience, if you want, you know, what, what Hankerin and I were talking about uh, on Monday, you want that super high high of this is, this is like D&D &D on top of my D&D. &D. At that point, uh, you should be playing a paladin. Because they've got spells, they've got swords... Um, they're, they're walking around in a giant plate bucket with a shield so you can't knock them over. They've got magical horses, uh, which eventually can become magical pegasus is. So, yeah, that's, that's all of the goodness that you're getting into with a paladin in 5e. And there are ways to make a paladin absolutely a nightmare for a dungeon master trying to challenge you. What we are going to be talking about today, though, is a very non-traditional paladin. Um, I am glad that Ronan likes my pancakes. Uh, Ronan, for the record, is not a paladin. Ronan, like uh, our other cat, Nora, is a rogue. Actually, no. Nora's a rogue. Nora's not in here. Usually she's sleeping right over my shoulder, but Nora is not here. Nora's a rogue. Uh, Ronan's a barbarian. Because while Ronan can sneak around and, you know, be very silent, a la Conan, uh, he is also very unsubtle and very headstrong, and he will bowl you over. Nora's not really a paladin. I guess we were having this discussion last night. Nora does uh, keep us from having bad dreams. Uh, and she can she can definitely wallop uh, Ronan. So I guess Nora can cast protection from good and evil. But I think of Nora as more of a rogue. It's just generally, I think of all cats as rogues. <clears throat> so, to let you guys know the resources we'll be using to build our Dexterity Paladin today, um, mostly it's going to be PHB. 
The Paladin Oath that we'll be talking about today is the Oath of Vengeance. It's available in the player's handbook. So there's not a lot of extraneous material that we'll be using. We might crack open Xanathar's Guide a little bit to talk about maybe a spell or something. But what we're mostly dealing with today is uh, PHB material. I'm also going to be referencing a website called RPG Bot, which has uh, class guides for all of the 5e classes and subclasses and spells. Uh, this is more for flavor as far as, um, you know, why something's good. It gives a little bit of explanation as to, uh, you know, in layman's terms outside of the game, why something is good, why something is not as good, um, all that. So, those are the resources we'll be using uh, before we crack. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the uh, character sheet that I've created and uh, talk a little bit about paladins in general before we talk about uh, my specific dexterity paladin. So, join me over on the other side. Hello, hello. Welcome to the bottom corner where I am now. This is the character sheet of one Solomon Markham Windsor, my vengeance paladin, my dexterity paladin. Already you can probably see that I have committed one of the cardinal sins of paladindom and that I have dumped strength. This is because this is a dexterity build, uh, so we'll, we'll get into that in just a little bit. So one thing that we should talk about before we get into anything else is why dexterity paladins are a little bit more unusual. I've already discussed paladins as this, like, immovable wall of holy plate metal, um, or plate, plate armor, rather, and that's very much the, the cultural consensus on what a paladin is and what a paladin does. And that's because paladins are a relic of, or not a relic, they, they come to us from Charlemagne. Charlemagne's time is very much where uh, the, the paladin as a concept comes into play. So uh, it's, it's this idea of a warrior bound to an oath that is uh, you know, greater than himself, uh, greater than like an oath to uh, a king or a noble, and because of this, uh, you know, he has magical powers, or he has uh, holy powers. <clears throat> and because of the, you know, like trappings of Charlemagne, um, you know, that's, that's where, you know, a, a paladin's a knight, a knight and a priest mixed together. And so they've got, you know, the, the full plate armor like a knight does. And they fight with a, an arming sword or a long sword and a shield, um, you know, because like a knight does. Although most knights fought with a lance because they were mounted warriors. But anyway, in our minds, that's what a paladin is. Uh, but there's another very famous paladin that's different from this, and me calling this guy a paladin is stretching the definition of paladin uh, as we know it. But I feel like it fits very much because this character is what's referred to as a willpower hero. This is a character who um, is devoted to God in his stories. He's you know he's very much he's a devout. Uh, believer and follower of the Christian religion. And because of this, he has, you know, ultra willpower, ultra determination. Uh, basically, nothing can stop him. He is all persistent and, uh, you know, always able to come back and smite his foes. 
And if you listen to you know my, my conversation with Hanker and Fernell on Monday, you already know that I'm talking about Solomon Kane. Uh, Solomon Kane is not typically thought of as a paladin, but if a paladin is a holy warrior, then I would argue Solomon Kane is in fact a paladin. He does not cast spells uh, because in in the realm of you know Robert E. Howard Solomon Kane, uh, casting spells is very different than what like the D and D conception of casting spells is. A lot of Howard's stuff was actually very low magic, so even in Conan, uh, you know, wizards and warlocks and stuff like that, they're they're doing rituals and they're uh, you know like binding enchantments and p- bestowing curses and you know performing sacrificial rites and stuff like that. They're not necessarily throwing around fireballs, uh, which is something that I find interesting and something that I'd definitely like to incorporate into uh, games in the future. I I have this temptation, even though I like, you know, like the Forgotten Realms-style uh, regular, uh, you know, off-the-rack D&D, where you can toss around massive amounts of spells... I'm tempted to, like, forego all traditional D&D and exclusively play uh, in a sword and sorcery style, but I know that I'm not going to be able to stick with that. Uh, Because eventually I'm going to be like, I want some magic items. I want to give some some people some magic items. But I definitely love sword and sorcery. And uh, I I find it very inspirational to the work that I do, and, you know, obviously, I'm going to say it again, I'm a relative of Robert E. Howard, Uh, he's my fifth cousin four times removed, and uh, I I find great inspiration in his work. So this this character is very much based on Solomon Cain. Now this is not, I, I just want to clear this up real quick, this is not a Solomon Cain build. I will do that someday. I will I will do an episode where we build straight up Solomon Kane. Uh, this the the flavor of Solomon Kane is very much present in in this build. Um, so that's that's kind of where the inspiration comes from. Uh, but you know, if I say you know this is my Solomon Kane build, excuse me. <clears throat> There's going to be all kinds of questions about, well, why did you go this way? Why not this way? Why'd you do this? Solomon Cain can't do that, on and on and on. So, to, you know, get all of that out of the way, this is inspired by Solomon Cain. And I say that like there's a legion of Solomon Cain people out there who are just, like, waiting to jump down my throat because I portrayed him the wrong way. Uh, When, in fact, I'd mostly just incur the ire of Shane Hensley. If I screwed up Solomon Kane, it's like him and then me and then uh, Razor Fist from YouTube. We're, we're the three people that care deeply about Solomon Kane, and it seems like everyone else just kind of forgets that he exists. So, yeah, there's that. Anyway, uh, another thing to discuss about this build um, this is built in uh, my good friend Shag's Legend of the Five Elders game. Uh, So I created this character as a backup to uh, Hong Su Chang if he should fall in battle. Um, I I don't typically create backup characters uh, just because I get so focused on how much I love a certain character, and I definitely love Hong Su. It's just I have tons of time to think of character ideas now. Uh, I'm constantly thinking about what kind of character I'd want to play. I'm constantly building characters in uh, Hero Forge and uh, Eldritch Foundry. So, you know, I was just thinking about kind of what fits within the world that Shag has created, and this is very much uh, a character that works in that particular world. So, <clears throat> this is Solomon Markham Windsor. He is a human uh, within the realm of uh, Shag's Five Elders game. He is from Garamond, 
which is basically um, Industrial Revolution Europe. So uh, we didn't really talk about this a lot in my episode on Hong Su, because we were mostly focused on the martial arts aspect. Uh, but Shag's world is very much... Um, it's very much like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Shaw Brothers martial arts movies uh, with the like wushu wire jumping and, and stuff like that mixed with um, Industrial Revolution, Colonization Era, China and Japan where Europe was uh, open to uh, the Far East. So there's a lot of that in this game as well. So there's gunpowder and firearms and stuff like that that's present in the world, which definitely informs this particular character because, of course, he's based on Solomon Kane. So, <clears throat> Solomon Markham Windsor is, uh, like I said, a 7th level Vengeance Paladin. I have all of his stats built out um, because I find it very tedious to, you know, like, arrange stats and stuff like that. Basically, what I did, though, was I put my highest, uh, I'd use standard array, and I put uh, dexterity as my highest, charisma as my second highest, and constitution as the third highest. When it comes to paladins, uh, you've got three primary stats that need to be your best. Uh, your attack stat, which, if you are traditional, is going to be strength. If you're doing finesse, dexterity. And then, uh, you know, whether you're going strength or dexterity, uh, you dump the other one. Because the other one's not important. There's a lot of paladins who go last in initiative because they've got a minus one to their dex. But then your next highest needs to be charisma because that's your casting stat. Uh, all of your magic comes from charisma. And um, in, in this way, a paladin is a good party face. Uh, there, there are kind of three main, actually four classes that really can serve as a good party face based on, uh, you know, the, the way that their stats need to be in order to be effective. Uh, so that's the bard, the paladin the Warlock, and the Sorcerer. All of them use Charisma as their casting stat. Um, and so all of them will end up being party faces. Or can be party faces. My Warlock is currently an Edgelord. Uh, big time. So, he's not doing a lot of party face stuff, but he could. Because he's got a uh, plus four to his charisma. So I could definitely, <clears throat> as soon as we encounter party face stuff with Hong Su, I will, I will take on that role, especially now that we lost our bard. Uh, one, one of our players was playing a bard. Now he's switched over to, uh, I believe he's a fighter. He actually, no, he's a, he's a pugilist. I think he's using the homebrew pugilist class. <clears throat> but that's what he's doing. So now we don't have a party face, so I have the highest charisma. It'll end up being me. Anyway. You want those to be your two highest, and then constitution also needs to be pretty high because uh, you need hit points. Part of being the defender or the tank is having a high number of hit points as well as a high AC. Uh, so you'll definitely, definitely need that. Now, <clears throat> when you create a paladin, you're starting, not stats, but abilities. It's right before ranger, right after monk. Just getting there. Okay. So, <laughs> your uh, proficiencies when you start, you get all armor, shields, uh, basically all weapons, simple and martial. Um, you don't get any tool proficiencies. Uh, you'll have to pick those up with the background. 
Your saving throws are wisdom and charisma, as you can see on the sheet. And uh, you get to choose two skills from athletics, insight, intimidation, medicine, persuasion, and religion. Uh, so, and then I got a couple others because I picked the noble background, which gives you more skills, and I'm a variant human, which gives you proficiency in another skill. So what we're looking at with the paladin right now is uh, acrobatics, history, insight, intimidation, and persuasion. And those are my skills. <clears throat> So, as far as what I'm carrying, uh, I currently have a rapier. It's a plus two rapier because uh, when our characters start out, uh, Shag gave us all plus two weapons. So, he's carrying a, a plus two rapier. I also gave him a pistol and a musket because he is a Solomon Kane type character. Um... But as far as abilities that you get just for being a paladin, the first one is Divine Sense. And uh, what this lets you do is, as an action, you basically um, open your mind and you can feel good and evil around you. And uh, what it lets you do is, until the end of your next turn, you know the location of any celestial, fiend, or undead within 60 feet of you uh, that is not behind total cover. You know its type. Um, but you can't necessarily identify it. So, if there is a lich who is hanging out in the wizard's tower... Uh, you can tell that he is undead, but you can't necessarily tell that he's a lich. Or, as the example in the PHB puts it, you know that the guy's undead, but you can't immediately say, oh, that's that's Count Strahd von Zerovich, and he's a vampire. Although Strahd's not exactly going to hide from you. If any of you have read over Curse of Strahd, you know that Strahd's just, like, always popping in, being like, Hello! What are you up to? I'm just reminding you that I am here. Ah, ah, ah. I don't know why I made Strahd Count Von Count. And if I ever run Curse of Strahd, that's going to be a major problem. The fact that my Strahd voice sounds like that. I know my players aren't going to be able to take that seriously. I'll have to change that up. Because Strahd's a lot, you know, darker and more interesting than that. He's not... <laughs> he's not Leslie Nielsen and Dracula dead and loving it. That's a reference. <clears throat> but yeah, that that's what Divine Sense does. Um, yeah, it's basically insight for... Well... That dropped us down. It's basically insight for identifying what's essentially a paladin's favorite enemy. Although, unlike with rangers, you don't get to choose your favorite enemy. Uh, it's chosen for you because you are the fist of God. And you can also uh, you can also detect any place that's been consecrated or. Uh, desecrated with the hallowed spell in the same radius and you can use it um a number of times equal to one plus your charisma modifier so for me i could use it up to four times per long rest and then the other thing that you get at first level is lay on hands uh, which is basically the best healing spell that you can get as a paladin um, you have a hit point pool that's equal to your paladin level times five. So at seventh level, you're looking at 35 hit points. And at any time you can use an action to touch a creature and draw hit points from that pool and restore, uh, a number of hit points to that creature. And then, um, 
I believe you get that back at the end of a long rest. And you can also, with this, uh, instead of giving people uh, hit points back, you can expend five hit points to cure a disease or um, neutralize a poison. And, you know, like if someone has multiple different diseases or poisons on them, you can expend five hit points at a time to rid them of that. Uh, so it, it does kind of cut down on the amount of times you'll need to use, like, lesser restoration. Um, it can't remove curses, so you'll still need that. You'll still need, like, cleric spells for that. I don't know if you end up getting um, greater or lesser restoration or, uh, you know, remove curse or anything like that. I'll need to check the spell list. And then by second level, you've got your uh, fighting style. So <clears throat> you don't have as many options as the fighter. Your options are defense, dueling, great weapon fighting, and protection. Um, the best one here is dueling, which gives you a plus two bonus to damage rolls with a weapon. Uh, it's usable with a shield. Whoops. Nope, not that. There we go. No, wrong one. Here we are. <clears throat> it's usable with a shield. Um... And if we go over to uh, the RPG bot, which explains some of the uh, fighting styles. Yeah, the, the best ones that it explains here are defense and dueling. Defense basically just gives you more AC. So if you want to have like a 23 AC, you can take defense. Dueling is the best, though, so rather than, uh, you know, using a, rather than using a great weapon, you can just use a, uh, or, or using a, a longsword two-handed, or a versatile weapon two-handed, you can use it one-handed and make up the gap in damage and still have the AC of a shield, so... That's that's a good thing to, to have, uh, you know, when you have a shield. Which a lot of paladins are going to end up being sword and board or hammer and board. Uh, that's, that's just kind of the way it is. Even this one is sword and board. Uh, as much as I wanted to avoid it, there's really no other option. I could go without a shield, but then I have a lower AC. And then you get your, your uh, spell casting. Uh, paladins are half casters, and most of your spell casting is going to go towards Divine Smite. Which we'll get to in just a second. And your spell casting focus is the holy symbol. Uh, so all paladins are going to have like a holy symbol or something like that. That's where you focus your magic from. Most of the time, though, your magic is focused on the weapon that you're using. So there's that. And then uh, Divine Smite. Starting at second level, when you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack, you can expend one paladin cell spell slot to deal radiant damage to the target in addition to the weapon's damage. The extra damage is 2d8 for a first level spell slot, plus 1d8 for each spell each spell level higher. Uh, you max out at 5d8. I believe uh, that's about as high as your spell slots can go. And then you get to add an extra d8 to your smite, no matter the spell level, if the target is undead or a fiend. So remember, undead and fiends... Uh, can kiss your ass if you're a paladin. Basically, they can't do anything to you. Um, and you can do all kinds of nasty to them. 
So if you're using a long sword, or in this case, a rapier, and you smite, and let's say, uh, you know, for the sake of argument, you are smiting a uh, Galabrazu, one of those four-armed things with the, the, they've got two short arms that are regular and then two giant uh, claw arms. They're, they're demons, for anyone who doesn't know, the Galabrazu. Look them up, they're freaky. You're fighting one of those. And you hit with a weapon attack. If you just expend um, a, a first level spell slot on that attack, you were looking at 4d8. And just to put that into perspective, let me go to the page here. put that in per into uh, perspective a fireball deals 8d6 damage you were dealing 4d8 so it's half as many dice but you have a higher chance to uh to deal damage and that's just on the base uh level so let's say in fact give me just one second i'm gonna grab 4d8 from my dice bag and show you uh basically what would happen there Okay, I have my chainmail dice pouch, which means that I take this game seriously. I'm getting my dice out. Naturally, all of my D8s are buried. I have to grab my secondary dice bag. Because I only had 3d8 in my primary dice bag. I'm going to grab just two more. There we go. Just to demonstrate how this can scale. So keep in mind, this is something you can do at uh, first level. Actually, not for at second level. Second level is when you get Divine Smite. Just putting my dice back in my uh, my secondary dice bag. I have two dice bags because, again, I'm a dungeon master. I am not a dice person. Like, some people are obsessive about dice. Uh, I am, like, whatever tool will get the job done. That's, that's my philosophy when it comes to dice. I don't really... Uh, I'm not really a guy who's obsesses over, you know, having a large amount of dice. I've, I've got friends who are. Uh, my, my good friend Lucas is, he's a dice fanatic. He obsesses over getting new dice. But I obsess over minis, so, you know, 
everyone's got their vice. Everyone's got their vice when it comes to this game. Anyway, so you were casting, uh, you're doing just a regular smite at, uh, you know, first level. You're using a rapier or a longsword uh, with a shield. So you're dealing a D8 damage base. So. 4D8. So what I rolled here was 15. 15 damage. And this is as a first level character. Then you add your strength or dexterity modifier, which at this point should be a plus three, depending on how you did point by, and a plus one proficiency bonus. Uh, that's to the attack, though. So plus three. Uh, you'd be looking at 18 damage. And then um, keep in mind that... If you are going up against a uh, a fiend, excuse me, sorry. If you're going up against a fiend or an undead, they typically have vulnerability to radiant damage. So, in that case, um, from what I rolled here, the 1, the 5, and the 4, so 10, that's doubled. When you're vulnerable, it's double damage. So, 18 base damage plus another 10 is 28 damage that you can deal to an undead or fiend creature uh, at second level as a paladin. That's, th this, is, this is why you don't mess with paladins. <laughs> that, this is second level, second level type stuff. Uh, and then if you go higher, like if you cast it, at the level that I'm at right now, let me scroll down here so you guys can see my spell slots. I've got four first level spell slots and three second level spell slots. So if we cast this at a second level spell slot, um, you'd be looking at an additional D8. And again, let's say this is up against a fiend, so we get the additional D8. It's like rolling sneak attack for a rogue. Only all you have to do is expend a spell slot. It doesn't matter the position of the uh, combatant. So here. You've got uh, 10, 20, 25 damage. Take out the 2. Actually, make this easier. Uh, math wise, let's take out the 5. That's our rapier damage. So five uh, piercing damage. 20 radiant damage. If you're up against a fiend or an undead, that's 40 radiant damage. 45 damage from a single sword attack. And it's a second level spell slot. A fireball is a third level, and usually you're dealing about that level of damage. I've got 8d6 here, so we can do the math. Okay, so. So, I rolled 30 damage on that fireball let's assume that you know you're targeting a, in that radius you get four people so let's make four dexterity saves 17 16 14 11 so three of those guys pass depending on their modifiers but a 17 and a 16, at the very least, will pretty much always pass a dexterity save. Uh, especially at, 
you know, seventh level. Your spell save DC around this time is usually somewhere around 14 to 16. And 16's on the high side. So most of the people in that room are going to be taking only 15 damage. Whereas the paladin just has to hit with the attack. Uh, and it's, it's only to one target. But you're going to deal 45 damage to that target with no save as long as you hit. Uh, if they're undead or a fiend, you get an extra d8. It deals double damage. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's 45 damage with no save that you, uh, just put out onto a single target. And it can be upcast where it's up to 5d8. And that's 5d8 base. Uh, 5d8 without the addition of the extra d8, um, for a fiend or undead. So if you, like, at, at, you know, 20th level, you're fighting a baller. You can be rolling a rapier attack with uh, 7d8. And he's going to deal, he's going to take double damage. So yeah, paladins, uh, paladins kick some ass. That's, uh, that's what they do. And again, you can do this at second level. You can only use a first level spell slot, but you yeah, you can you can put out some serious uh, some serious damage at second level, and it's hard to hit you because you're wearing heavy armor and you have a shield. <clears throat> so, and on top of that, at third level, you become immune to disease. And then also at third level, um, you are you get your oath. You get your sacred oath. Now, unlike clerics, paladins uh, no longer are tied to specific gods. You can be. Um, in fact, there are... I think that might actually be its own separate oath. It's like an oath to a specific power or deity. Uh, but what we're talking about today is the Oath of Vengeance. So, it's, it's uh, you know, one of the best oaths that you can take as a paladin. I'll show you guys the other ones in just a second. Uh, but this one fit most thematically with the character I was going for, because, you know, I didn't want to... The other one I was going to take was Oath of Conquest, but I didn't want to be an evil character. So, from the PHB... The Oath of Vengeance is a solemn commitment to punish those who have committed a grievous sin. When evil forces slaughter helpless villagers, when an entire people turn against the will of the gods, when a thieves' guild grows too violent and powerful, when a dragon rampages through the countryside, at times like these, paladins arise and swear an oath of vengeance to set right that which has gone wrong. To these paladins... No, to these paladins, sometimes called Avengers or Dark Knights, their own purity is not as important as delivering justice. So, you are quite literally like the fist of vengeance as a vengeance paladin, which I feel fits great with Solomon Kane. And, you know, with with being a Vengeance Paladin, you get access to a couple of spells. Um, all Paladins have their own kind of spell list that they add to the regular Paladin um, overall spell list. So we'll get to those in just a second. But first we need to talk about the Channel Divinity, which you get with any... Uh, you get with any of the sacred oaths. All of them have a channel divinity. Which, uh, let's see. Which, 
When you take this oath at third level, you gain the following two channel divinity options. Abjure enemy. As an action, you present your holy symbol and speak a prayer of denunciation using your channel divinity. Choose one creature within 60 feet of you that you can see. This character must make a wisdom saving throw unless it's immune to being frightened. Fiends and undead have disadvantage on the saving throw. On a failed save, the creature is frightened for one minute or until it takes any damage. While frightened, the creature's speed is zero and it can't benefit from any bonus to its speed. On a successful save, the creature's speed is halved for one minute until the creature takes any damage. And then there's Vow of Enmity. As a bonus action, you can utter a Vow of Enmity against a creature you can see within 10 feet of you using your channel divinity. You gain advantage on attack rolls against this creature for one minute or until it drops to zero hit points or fails or, or falls unconscious. So Vow of Enmity works really well with one of the Paladin's best spells, uh, that being Compelled Duel. So it's a great way to like take on uh, kind of the toughest monster. So let's go over here real quick to RPG Bot and take a look at it's actually the subclasses. <clears throat> and I believe Channel Divinity. is just something that you can use whenever you want. Someone will have to back me up on that. It, it usually takes an action. No, here we go. Channel Divinity. From the PHB. Your oath allows you to channel divine energy to fuel magical effects. Each channel... <clears throat> Each channel divinity option provided by your oath explains how to use it. When you use your channel divinity, you choose which option to use. You must then finish a short or long rest to use your channel divinity again. So you can do it once per short or long rest. So it's something you definitely want to save for the boss monster. I'm glad I actually read that because uh, that would be very misleading. Basically, you want to, uh, you know, save kind of the Vow of Enmity. Uh, now, <clears throat> one thing about Abjure Enemy. Um, Abjure Enemy is actually not great. Because instead of turning your enemies, um, they can't go anywhere. So they can still attack and they can still cast spells. Uh, whereas, you know, like if they're afraid... Or like a like a dragon's fear. Dragon's fear, you basically have to run away from it, so you can attack, uh, but you can't do like melee attacks. And then, um, yeah, frightened creature has a, has disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls while the source of its fear is within line of sight. So yeah, it's it's basically, it's fear, but they can't move. So they can attack you at disadvantage, but they're still standing there. So it, it's not the greatest option, but Vow of Enmity is a minute of guaranteed advantage, as uh, RPG Bot puts it. So, you know, when you're in a boss battle, you can definitely break that one out. So we've talked a lot about paladins in general. Uh, but what makes a dexterity paladin uh, kind of different from just a regular paladin? Honestly, it's not a whole lot. The primary difference is the weapons that you're using and the armor that you're wearing. And this is why I, I talk about the viability of this build. Uh, basically, as a dexterity paladin, you're going to want to be wearing um, studded leather. Let me kind of check up on that real quick. 
because my guy's wearing studded leather. He's wearing studded leather because, like, plate armor's not really a thing in the setting that Shag has. It's, I guess it's around, but it's not really common. So, I wanted to fit in more with the world that Shag had, uh, rather than go with, like, a full plate paladin. But yeah, you want to be wearing... Uh, Pardon me. <clears throat> Sorry. You want to be wearing um, light or medium armor. You can go all the way up to half plate. That maxes your AC out at 17. And then with a shield, you have 19. Uh, so that's kind of your, your top level with half plate. If you have a higher dexterity, like if you go up to 20... Um, I mean, either way, you're still at 17. Your, your max AC is going to end up being a 19. At least at this stage, you know, if you max out your decks. Uh, so it's a matter of, you know, do you want disadvantage on, uh, stealth checks or not? But yeah, y you can go either way, um... Just depending on the build that you want. So, studded leather is not necessarily your only option or your best option. Um, it's definitely the cheapest one you can get for the longest time, though. So, one thing you, you'd you probably want to look for as a dexterity paladin would be, uh, you know, plus two armor. Or something like that. Something that'll give you a bonus to your AC, um, along with the shield, so that you can get up to, the, like, a 23 AC, like a lot of Paladins have. So. Let's get back to the Paladin page. We're still on Ranger. My PHB is a mess. It's falling apart. <clears throat> so, those are kind of the generalities around um, a paladin and, and what's cool about them at this level. Um, I guess we should talk about Aura of Protection as well. You do get an extra attack at 5th level, uh, like you do with most martial classes. But the Aura of Protection at 6th level, um, any friendly creature within 10 feet of you uh, gets a bonus equal to your Charisma modifier to their saves. And then at 18th level, the range increases out to 30 feet. So, anyone making a save within 10 feet of me gets to add plus 3 to any saving throw. And I get to add plus three to my saving throws. So, let's take a look at my saving throws here. Even, like, if I have to make a strength save, I still get to add plus three to it. So, I end up getting a plus two. Even these saves that I'm not uh, proficient with, and one that I am proficient with, uh, you know, my... Uh, my wisdom save. Wisdom save seems a little bit high. Because my wisdom's plus one. Yeah, this should be plus four. Sorry. Because, yeah. You add your proficiency bonus, yeah. So, anyway, that's still a plus seven. It's plus nine for charisma. Um, it's plus five for constitution, which is great. Con saves are difficult. Barely anyone's proficient with them, and uh, con saves can mess you up, so it's good to have a bonus on those. I'm pretty much never going to get hit by a fireball. 
because I get to add six to my uh, deck save. And I took the Shield Master fate, which, or feat, which we'll get to in just a little bit. So yeah, those are all kind of the general Paladin things and the Oath of Vengeance things. Um, the PHB feat that we need to talk about, uh, it's, it's one of the best ones for a Paladin. That is the Shield Master feat. I would argue that it's uh, essential for any paladin that is doing um, sword and board. Pretty much any build that does sword and board, uh, this is an essential feat. <clears throat> so, if you take the attack action on your turn, you can use a bonus, bonus action to shove a creature within five feet of you with your shield. So what this means for a two-attack paladin, um, you hit once with the sword, you push with the shield, and if you hit, they're knocked prone, and the next attack is at advantage. <clears throat> and anyone else around you, if they attack that person, their attack's at advantage. In addition to that... If you aren't incapacitated, you can add your shield's AC bonus to any dexterity saving throw you make against a spell or another harmful effect that targets only you. So, if you have to make a personal dexterity save, um, and you have shield master, you get to add... So, for dexterity save, I've got plus three... I have plus four, actually. I don't know what I was doing here. <clears throat> plus four, plus seven for my uh, aura. And then plus another two, so that's plus nine on a dexterity saving throw. Uh, this, is, this is why dex paladins are good. Plus nine to dexterity save. And if you are subjected to an effect that allows you to make a dexterity saving throw to take only half damage, you can use your reaction to take no damage if you succeed on the saving throw, interposing your shield between yourself and the source of the effect. So it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like evasion. Only on evasion, you can take half damage uh, if you fail. So on this one, it's like the it's like the other it's the the succeed portion of uh, evasion that rogues and rangers get. So if I succeed on a dexterity saving throw, and this one does not uh, doesn't have to be just targeting me. So this would be like a fireball. If I make my uh, if I make my plus seven dexterity saving throw on a fireball, I can also put my shield up and, uh, you know, get the rest of the fire off of me and take no damage. Dex Paladin. It's great. You need that shield master. Anyone who is, um, any, anyone who's using sword and board, take shield master. It's it's worth it. It gives you advantage. It's it's a great it's a great feat. If your DM allows feats, and you're using a sword and shield, shield master. It's one of the most not overpowered, but you know, like powerful feats. It really has a great impact on. Um, <clears throat> sorry, has a great impact on your ability to stay alive if you have a shield. So, with that out of the way, let's talk specifically about this character. Um, so what we have here, like I said, this is a Solomon Kane type character. His name is Solomon Markham Windsor. I took the Solomon part. Uh, he has a noble background, and he's basically um, he's basically the main character from the Count of Monte Cristo. In that he was betrayed by another noble, 
Uh, he was sold out to an enemy, and he was presumed dead. He didn't go to prison, uh, but he had to flee. And he has sworn vengeance against this enemy who has now become a, uh, a high-ranking member of kind of the court of Garamond. And he's one of the, the major traitors in, in and around, uh, you know, Garamond within the world of canon, which is Shag's world. He uses a rapier and uh, a pistol and occasionally a musket. And this is what he looks like. Uh, no one is going to recognize this guy because this game is super forgettable. This is the main character from the uh, the Order 1886. I just pulled his picture because he had the cool chops and the mustache, and you know he looks like a noble. <clears throat> I gave him light brown hair, six three, two hundred pounds. You know, kind of like a middleweight fighter almost. And he is using a rapier and uh, a shield. This is something I wanted to talk a little bit about because I it's a thing that bothers me a little bit about 5th edition, the lack of variety in weapons. I know it's it's historically accurate to use a buckler with a rapier. That makes sense. <clears throat> but D&D &D is so focused on um, historic, or not not historic, on, uh, like, kind of medieval aesthetic around fantasy. It forgets about, like, Renaissance-era stuff. <clears throat> like, firearms are tucked into the back pages of the DMG. But also, um, I wanted this character to, like, fight with a rapier and a main gauche, which, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, is a parrying dagger. There's not an option for that. I can, I can flavor that my my buckler is a main gauche, but that doesn't make sense with shield master. So it, I guess it's good that I have a buckler, because then my my build makes sense. But th this is something that's been kind of tumbling around in my head. You know, why can't we use parrying daggers? Why aren't there rules for stuff like that? Um, it, it's kind of inspiring me to want to write a supplement for 5th edition to, like, expand weapon offerings. So I, I'm kind of tossing that around. That's just something I want to talk about real quick. Um, and here I will actually show you guys the miniatures I've designed. Uh, real quick, though, I'm going to take a, a short break, and I will be right back.
All right, I am back. Just had to uh, get some tea. I'm a little bit congested. Hmm, just a little bit. There we go. Anyway, this is, uh, you know, Solomon Markham Windsor. This is what he looks like. He's 33 years old. Uh, blue eyes, brown hair, fair skin. We'll get to spells here in just a little bit to uh, to kind of round out the discussion. Uh, but real quick, I wanted to show you guys some of what uh, I created as far as custom miniatures uh, for this particular character. Uh, just to kind of show off a couple things. So let's start with Hero Forge. This is Solomon Markham Windsor as I made him in Hero Forge. And I like that Hero Forge now has this color feature. Um, one thing that it does, I, I think a lot of people do this with Hero Forge. Um, we design a lot of miniatures just to see how they look and don't order them. That's, I mean, that's what I do. I have a couple Hero Forge miniatures, but only, I think I only have two. Uh, one's for Cromwell, and the other one is uh, the, the first miniature I ever got. Actually, second. Which is for T-Win. Who I've not talked about in a long time. Um, <clears throat> but that, that was the second miniature that I got. The first one I got came with the paints that I got to paint Tewin, uh, and that was Minsk from Baldur's Gate. And I am not going to show you guys that miniature because it's ugly. I did not do a good job. I did a good job up until I got to the, uh, the yin-yang on his head. I'd actually like to try Minsk again. Uh, I think there's another Minsk mini out there, so I might, I might get it and, uh, try again and... Post the contrast on Instagram just to show you guys how far I've come as a painter. I hope it works out. <laughs> anyway, just to kind of show you guys, you know, like what this would look like. Um, I mean, like if I got uh, if I got premium plastic, you'd be looking at the thirty dollar mini. Uh, <clears throat> I would not get this thing painted. Um, or colored because I like to paint them. I like to paint these minis. So if I got, um, if I got one of these, if I ordered a mini colored, it would be, first of all, it would be like $45, which is too much for a miniature. Arguably, $29 is too much for a miniature. Um, it is a custom miniature, and their sculpts are very good. So I understand why it's $29, but still, that's a lot. But if you're in the market for a custom miniature, I mean, that's, that's competitive price. So... Suffice it to say, you know, this is kind of something I like doing. More often than not these days, I will go on Reaper and find a miniature that looks good enough. Because uh, they do have a lot of good miniatures. There, there's so many great miniatures out there. Um, sometimes you don't even need to make a custom miniature. But if you have a really weird character type, then, then maybe... Like if you have an orc bard you're probably going to need uh, a custom miniature, I'm sorry to say. So yeah, this this is what he looks like. I'm actually going to uh, change something up here because the breastplate, uh, you know, it's, it's metal, and technically he's wearing uh, leather armor. So let me get my Outlaw Duster Brown. That's a little bit ugly. Let's go to... There we go. 
That's better. I kind of like the idea of these ribs being metal. So let's do... Yeah, like that. Hmm. Let's try darker leather, just to, for the sake of contrast. Mm, lighter? Let's try something flashy. There we go. That's, that's a little bit better. I might, if I were to get this colored, I might just go with, uh, might just go with all the same leather color. Or what I could do is something like that. So all the accents are the same color. I could do the straps that way too. Yeah, that's a little bit. There has to be contrast, but also uniformity. Or what's, let's see, what color? There we go. So all of the contrasts are the same same color there yeah that's more the ticket i like that better anyway this is just me being persnickety because i can be um so yeah i'll go ahead and save that and this is just this is a good reference for kind of what the character looks like uh like i could take a screenshot of this and send it to the dm and say you know this is what my character looks like But as you can see, you know, he's got the pistols, he's got the, uh, he has a buckler on his back, he has the rapier, and I like the, the hat. I like the idea of him having that hat. So yeah, this is good. My problem with this miniature is the face. Um, all of the faces kind of look the same on Hero Forge miniatures. And they, they all have kind of a cartoony vibe to them, and there's really no getting around it. So, because of this, I actually want to show you guys an alternative. Uh, and I've talked about these guys before. I've ordered miniatures from them. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I have, like, I backed this on Kickstarter. But this is Eldritch Foundry, and this is what I made for uh, Solomon Markham Windsor on Eldritch Foundry. And I like this miniature a lot better, actually. I feel like this is a little bit more evocative of what I'm going for. Um, to, to contrast, you see that he has the mutton chops here. And I really wanted him to have like the sideburns and the mutton chops. Um, just just to, to be the way that he is. I feel like that's something that he would very much have. Um, if I go over to Hero Forge and we go to the facial hair, they have the, the they call it the old-timey bartender, but if you look at it, it's very grisly. It's very, uh, like, dwarfish. And it just kind of makes him look strange here. So the the Van Dyke looks a little bit better on the Hero Forge Mini than the old-timey bartender uh, sideburns and mustache. But on Eldritch Foundry, I mean, look at that guy. He makes it look tough. It's cool. It looks cooler here. Now, if I go, like, full-on... Like, if I, if I change his facial hair here... That's a little bit ugly. That's actually a lot bit ugly. But I mean, like, if I give him the... They, they have, like, the handlebar mustache. That looks a little bit... That That's pretty dignified. That's also not bad. But I really like the way this looks on this particular miniature. Um, it, there, there's a lot of gravitas there. Now... You might be thinking it looks stupid either way, uh, just because you don't like that uh, facial hairstyle. And I will say, in uh, 
in real life, it's very hard to pull off that look. Uh, I, I, I don't know if anyone can. In fact, Elfie and I were watching uh, the Zorro movies, the, the Antonio Banderas Zorro movies last night. And uh, one of the characters had this, uh, you know, like sideburns and connected mustache thing going on. And he looks stupid. Now, part of it was he had the neck beard. He, he did not shave off the neck beard. He had it connected down here as well. So just his chin was sticking out and it looked very weird. You have to disconnect everything on your chin from this right here. And this is a this is a facial hairstyle I could not pull off because one, Elfie would kill me. And two, uh, my mustache does not connect very well down here. So I'd look rather weird if I did that. I tried having mutton chops one time and it looked stupid. It honestly did. It was terrible. I thought it would be uh, unique. No. No, it just looked bad. <clears throat> so... These are the custom miniatures that I made. I really, I really like the way that the armor looks on this guy. Let's see if they have any new uh, weapons here. The only problem I have with Eldritch Foundry right now is, uh, for one thing, they do not have, unless they added it today. Nope, they don't have like the uh, the Cavalier hat which bothers me a little bit. They, they've got some really random stuff on here. You can see they've got like steampunk aesthetic stuff, but they don't have like a cavalier hat or a witch hunter's hat. They've kind of skipped over the, uh, like the Renaissance and the age of exploration time with a lot of their, uh, a lot of their items. Like, if we go into weapons, and we look at ranged, they also don't have flintlock pistols or muskets. They've got, like, space guns and uh, modern sniper rifles, uh, like Deus Ex pistols, a couple different kinds of revolver, Mausers, modern assault rifles, bolt-action rifle, and a lot of longbows and crossbows, but they don't have like a musket or a flintlock pistol. So I had to give them a book. But I think this is a very cool, very striking pose that he has here. Um, you know, he's, he's reading a book and then uh, someone comes in, so he pulls out a sword. That's I, I think that's pretty cool. Let's see if there's like a shield I can stick on his back. I don't think there is. At least not a good one. Yeah, that's too big. And as far as shields, I, I don't remember if they have a buckler or not. That's kind of a buckler. That's a... This is a classical buckler. But again, it's too big. That's more along the size of what a buckler is. <clears throat> Which, another thing that kind of bothers me a little bit about the way that... About the way that bucklers are, uh, you know... Or, sorry, about flavoring a... A buckler in this particular... Uh, in this particular game... You know, using Shield Master with it... Seems a little bit odd. Seem, seems a little odd to have a buckler, which is about the size of a hubcap on a car. About like, you know, that this big. To do something like Shieldmaster does. But still, I mean, you can, you can flavor it however you want. And now that I think about it, if I wanted to use like a rapier and a main gauche, like I initially talked about, and use Shieldmaster. 
you know, I can talk it over with the DM and say, look, I'm not trying to, you know, actually stab someone with the main gouge. Although you could do it that way. And I want to, I want to create like a feat where you can use a parrying dagger as if it were a shield, which is part of why I want to do like a weapon supplement at some point. But, you know, I, I could flavor it to say, you know, I, instead of shield bashing him, you know, I lunge at him with the dagger and I trip him. And, like, I use my leverage to, to, like, I put my foot in front of him as I lunge with the dagger and, you know, I catch him on the back foot or something like that and, and knock him over. Because it would basically, it would deal the same damage. And I could reflavor the other stuff around just being, like, agile. But still, it's, it's a little bit weird in the rules uh, how that would work. It's a lot of legwork to use when I could just say, okay, I have a buckler and I do shield master stuff. Because, you know, it gives me all those cool advantages. So, yeah, that's pretty much what's going on with the, uh, yeah, the custom miniature there. I really like this miniature. If I do end up playing this character, I'm going to order this one. I do have one free miniature left. I don't remember how much these things cost. Okay, yeah, these cost $29. So yeah, it's that's a competitive price within the realm of custom miniatures. So if you're doing a custom miniature, uh, be prepared to spend like $30 plus shipping. One other thing I've noticed now that I'm looking at this... Um, for the Eldritch Foundry guys, you should add holy symbols. I think, uh, you know, Hero Forge should add holy symbols as well. What both of them need is, like, items that can go across your chest. Because I wanted to do, like, a, a baldric of pistols, rather than having them at his side like a cowboy. I wanted him to have them, like, across his chest, like Blackbeard. But nobody has that option. That's something that I'd have to, like, describe, put in flavor-wise. You know, he has, he's got, like, three pistols across his chest. Or two. So, yeah. <clears throat> That's, that's my soapbox around, you know, custom miniatures and then also some of the weird weapons rules. So I'll go ahead and close these out. Um, but what we want to look at here real quick uh, to kind of round out the discussion of the paladin is spells. Uh, because paladins have a lot of different spells that you can, you can take. Um, most of them are going to be around Ronan, get down. Just to show you guys what I put up with on a daily basis, this is my cat Ronan trying to knock over my miniatures. He's a little turd blossom. And now he's rubbing his face against the, uh, the monitor. I should point the camera at him so that he gets the picture and he's not paying attention. Usually when I point a live camera at him, he runs away. Uh, but right now, he is ignoring the live camera. Ronan, don't knock my monitor over. Give me one second. Beat it.
Okay, he is not getting down, and uh, he's behind the monitor, and he chomps me anytime I try to pick him up. So we just have a cat behind the monitor right now. I hope he doesn't knock it over. If he does, I'm going to be upset. And he's about to cross over. Nope. No, he's just, he's behind the monitor now. Knocking stuff off my desk. This is living with a cat, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, paladin spells. Let's talk a little bit about them. We've got these paladin spells here. Uh, one thing we do need to talk about is different subclass spells, because you will get uh, different spells depending on the subclass that you have. So if we look at the Oath of Vengeance, uh, there's a couple spells that we get that are, you know, good options. Uh, you can always use Hunter's Mark, uh, which is a good ranger spell. It's one that I use a lot when I play rangers, because uh, it gives you a damage bonus against a single target. Uh, now, you get a lot of that anyway. So if you want to kind of, you know, like amp that up and add a lot more damage, you can um, <clears throat> you can definitely do that. Give me one more second. Looks like the cat is back on the miniatures. You, get down. Running! Sorry about that. He's got the devil in him. Anyway, you can also use Bane as a uh, vengeance paladin. And what Bane does for you, if we flip over to that particular uh, spell, one thing I'll say about Hunter's Mark while I'm flipping over to Bane is um, you can, it, it's a bonus action to cast, so you can still take your attack, you just can't shield bash, uh, which if you have shield master, that's primarily where your bonus actions are going. Uh, but you can also use a bonus action to move it when a creature drops, which is something that I wish you could do as a warlock, but sadly no. Anyway, <clears throat> what Bane lets you do is up to three creatures you can see uh, within range must make a charisma saving throw. Monsters all have bad charisma unless it's a dragon. And whenever a target fails that saving throw um, and they make an attack roll or a saving throw before the spell ends, they have to roll a d4 and subtract the number rolled from the attack roll or saving throw. Uh, it is concentration up to a minute. <clears throat> But it's a good way to, uh, you know, get anything that's like on the edge of hitting or missing. Like if it meets the AC, it's going to miss then. And it stacks against advantage. So even like the high roll in advantage, if a, uh, a monster has advantage against the party, you still have to subtract a D4 from it. So yeah, that's, that's definitely something that you can use. Um... And then the other spells that you can get as a Vengeance Paladin at 5th level, um, Hold Person, as the text here says, it's unreliable for a Paladin because your, your DC is going to be lower than, you know, like a wizard or something like that. It's not, it's not going to be something you can rely on necessarily. It's not the, uh, it, it's a good thing if you can... Uh, make them fail the save, but 
if you can't, then it's a wasted spell slot. I'm just getting over to the main paladin list here. So, with that out of the way, we move over to paladin spells. And we'll be looking at first and second level because that's what we are looking at uh, for this particular uh, build is, you know, it's a seventh level paladin. So that's, that's really kind of where we'll be living uh, for the time being. So, uh, Compelled Duel. That's one that I actually took. Let me scroll down to my spells. Compelled Duel. Uh, what this does, and this works really well with the Vow of Enmity on a, uh, not that one, that's my book. This works really well with the Vow of Enmity that the Vengeance Paladin can do. Basically, you, uh, you force your opponent into single combat with you, or they have disadvantage. So if we get to that one. <clears throat> it's another concentration spell. So the creature must make a wisdom saving throw, and on a failed save, uh, the creature is drawn to you, compelled by your divine demand, and for the duration... It has disadvantage on attack rolls against creatures other than you and must make a wisdom saving throw each time it attempts to move a space that is more than 30 feet away from you. And if the uh, save succeeds, the uh, spell doesn't restrict the target's movement for that turn. The spell ends if you attack any other creature if you cast a spell that targets a hostile creature other than the target, if a creature friendly to you damages the target or casts a harmful spell on it, or if you end your turn more than 30 feet away from the target. <clears throat> so basically, this is, uh, you know, within the battlefield, this is you pointing at the bruiser and saying, I got this, guys. And if they've got a low wisdom save, which if they're a bruiser, they probably do, then it's basically you versus that guy until they die. Now, if you have a player in your party who's a notorious uh, kill stealer, and they, you know, they like to come in and, and finish people off, which can happen, it's it's one of the like lesser sins of D and D, but it's still. Um, it, it can be annoying sometimes. That could create a problem for you because uh, then you lose the spell. So keep that in mind if you have a paladin with compelled duel. Um, they've got that. Don't don't worry about that. That's that's them. They'll take care of it. You take care. You mop up. You take care of everything around it. That's what paladins are really good at. Paladins are boss killers. So yeah. From my other spells, Wrathful Smite. <clears throat> Which is also a wisdom saving throw. Wisdom saving throw targets are good for uh, spells, because a lot of monsters, like the text here says, have very low wisdom scores. So. Wrathful Smite. Next time you hit with a melee weapon attack during the spell's duration, uh, your attack deals an extra 1d6 psychic damage. Additionally, if the target is a creature, it must make a wisdom saving throw or be frightened until that spell ends. 
As an action, the creature can make a wisdom check against your spell, save DC, to steal its resolve and end the spell. <clears throat> so, basically, it's, it's Hunter's Mark, but better for paladins, because it can also terrify your opponents. It can, you know, give them disadvantage on, uh, you know, attacks and, and checks and stuff like that. And it's a wisdom saving throw, so it's, it's, it's good. It's very good. It does take concentration, though. So... You, and you can't have two concentration spells going at the same time, which is something to always remember. Uh, next up on the list. Oh, Thunderous Smite. We have to talk about that, too. Not too terribly far away from there in the PHB. So we can, we can take a look at what the text here says um, <clears throat> so you lose a little bit of damage but you do get to knock people prone what thunderous smite does first time you hit with a melee weapon attack during the spell's duration your weapon rings with thunder that is audible within 30 feet, or sorry, 300 feet of you. And the attack deals an extra 2d6 thunder damage to the target. Additionally, if the target is a creature, it must succeed on a strength saving throw or be pushed 10 feet away from you and knocked prone. <clears throat> so yeah, you can do that as a bonus action if you don't want to shield bash. Um... You want to deal a little bit of extra damage. It's a cool thing. It's a cool thing to do. And you get the extra 2d6. So, from there. Uh, Shield of Faith. Shield of Faith gives you a little bit more AC... A shimmering field appears and surrounds a creature of your choice within range, granting it a plus two bonus to AC for the duration. Also concentration. Uh, you have a lot of concentration spells here. And compel duel we already talked about. And then protection from good and evil. Until the spell ends, another concentration spell. This one's more for uh, for social reasons. Although it can happen in combat as well. Until the spell ends, one willing creature you touch is protected against certain types of creatures, aberrations, celestials, elementals, fey, fiends, and undead. The protection grants several benefits. Creatures of these types have disadvantage on attack rolls against the target. The target also can't be charmed, frightened, or possessed by them. If the target is already charmed, frightened, or possessed by such a creature, the target has advantage on any new saving throws against the relevant effects. So. Immunity to being charmed, that's, that's a good thing. And then the last thing I want to talk about here as far as spells go is Find Steed. This is something that Elfie will love. Because it, of course, gives you a magical horse. It's only a paladin spell. So only paladins can get this. But yes, it gives you a, a magical horse. And what that does, you summon a spirit that assumes the form of an unusually intelligent, strong, and loyal steed. Creating a long-lasting bond with it. Appearing in an unoccupied space within range, 
The steed takes the form that you choose, such as a warhorse, pony, camel, elk, or mastiff. And it says your DM can allow other animals, depending on where you are. <clears throat> the steed has the, has the statistics of the chosen form, though it is a celestial fae or fiend you choose instead of a normal type. Additionally, your steed has an intelligence of, or if your steed has an intelligence of five or less, its intelligence becomes six. And it gains the ability to understand one language of your choice that you speak. Out of here. Your steed serves as a mount, both in combat and out. You have an instinctive bond. That allows you to fight as a seamless unit. While mounted on your steed, you can make any spell you cast that targets only you also target your steed. That is very interesting and cool. When the steed drops to zero hit points, it disappears, leaving behind no physical form. You can also dismiss your steed at any time as an action, causing it to disappear. In either case, casting the spell again summons the same steed restored to its hit point maximum. While your steed is within one mile of you, you can communicate with it telepathically. You can't have more than one steed bonded by this spell at any time. As an action, you can release the steed from its bond at any time, causing it to disappear. So, magical horse that you can communicate with telepathically. And ride into combat. It's cool. It's awesome. It works really well if you are multi-classing as a cavalier, which I guess you could do. I'd have to look into that. That that might be another episode. But yeah, that's pretty much what you're looking at for a 7th level uh, dexterity paladin. And so, while a lot of what you're dealing with um, comes down to you know, you have, you have a lower AC, um, you have the same damage output, and when it comes to dexterity saves, you are nigh untouchable. So, in, so instead of absorbing damage, you are uh, more just avoiding damage. So, <clears throat> it's pretty cool. It's pretty awesome. So yeah, that... As they say, is that that is the uh, dexterity paladin, and I will be super excited to give this a try sometime. Um, even if it doesn't end up happening for uh, Shag's game, like if if Hong Su lives to the end, uh, I can always break this out for another game, and it fits with pretty much any setting. Uh, the only thing you need to change is if your DM doesn't want to allow guns, you'd have to make that like a crossbow. But really, that's that's barely a compromise. And the pistols are very rarely going to come into play. It's more going to be like, oh, that thing's over there and you can't get to him. Uh, I'm going to shoot my pistol at him. So yeah. That is the Dexterity Paladin. Um, so that's going to do it for today's episode. I'm so glad that you guys were able to join me today. Uh, I hope you love it. I hope that you uh, you know want to use this character in one of your games. Uh, it would tickle me to no end to uh, see someone you know break out one of these builds, even though I didn't you know come up with it myself. You know the fact that you. You know, maybe we're exposed to this through uh, my show and it became a character that you really like. That's awesome. I'd love it. I'd love it. So yeah, let me know if you guys end up using this. You can always tweet at me at Howard underscore Ryan Gregg or uh, reach out to me at Roland Bones with Ryan at gmail.com to let me know if you've successfully used any of these builds. Uh, to let you guys know what's coming up next week uh, on Monday... Uh, that'll be the only stream we have, and we will be playing Knights of the Old Republic uh, by popular demand. And so I'll be talking a lot about Star Wars and a lot about that game, 
and it's just going to be a for fun stream, no audio version, just a fun video game stream as we head into a holiday. I'll do the same thing before Christmas. So yeah, that's pretty much it for today. Uh, guys, thank you so much for uh, joining me. I'm so glad that we could, uh, you know, do this and, and take a look at this particular build. Uh, I think it's cool. I hope you guys think it's cool. And until next time, whether you rolled a 1 or a 20, I'm so glad that you rolled your bones with me, Ryan Howard, and I'll see you next time.